Hey, it's Jessica Damasi with WTF Health. What's the future of health? I'm talking to the who's who of health tech and healthcare innovation. And today, we're going to take a deep dive look at what's going on with AI and big data as far as the R&D process in pharma is concerned. And so here to give us an inside look at what's going on, we have Najat Khan. She is the Chief Data Science Officer and Global Head of Strategy and Operations for R&D at the Janssen Pharmaceutical Companies of Johnson & Johnson. Najat, whoa, what a title. You've, you've got to have a lot of perspective on this. <laughs> Thank you. It's just great to be here. Thanks for having me. Looking forward to no, it. No, I'm excited to hear about this. And I, I think that this is a really topical um, thing to get into right now. But why don't you start us off, you know, and give us kind of from your perspective, talk to me a little bit about what's changed with data and AI, particularly in R&D, in pharma over the past five years. I mean, I think we've seen a lot of big changes. COVID was obviously an accelerant for the use of those yep. technologies. But what do you think has been the most important things that have changed in the past five years? Great question. Uh, one that's very close to my heart, of course. Um, so here's the thing. Look, in the last five years, five years ago, I remember we were talking about the potential of what AI, machine learning, data science overall could do, right, um, across the board. But it's really turned the corner from concept to true hard impact. And what are the drivers of that? I mean, first of all, the data aspect, the you know, at the end of the day, to do any of these algorithms, to have better data-driven insights, what do you need? You need better data, you need better algorithms, you need really fast compute, and fourth, you actually need a push from organizations to try to do things in a different way, to want to innovate, right? And I think all those four pieces are coming together right now in ways that hasn't before. So the amount of data that's being generated, and not just one type of data, right? So we used to talk a lot about genomic data. Now you have genomic, proteomic, transcriptomic. You have claims data, right? You have electronic health record data. Why is that all important? They all connect the dots to what a patient or a person's healthcare journey looks like. The better you have those journeys, the better you can predict why they're on that journey. Who's going to progress faster versus not? Is you know a disease really one disease, or is it actually seven, eight different types of disease? The whole concept of precision medicine, right? So that has changed a lot in the last five years. You know, by 2030, a third of the data generated overall in the world is going to be healthcare data. So think about that power. And then the next question comes to how do you mine that data? You know, first of all, the data sets have to be connected, they have to be diverse, but then better and better approaches to actually mine it in a way that where the signal to noise actually useful. And I think that's where machine learning, you mentioned generative AI. I mean, the last year, it's completely taken itself to a new level in terms of the application and become prime time. It's dinner table conversation now. So people are also starting to open up more and more about the power of what you can do, digital endpoints of what. Then the third piece I mentioned is compute power. Oh my gosh, I remember when I was doing this way back in the day in grad school, it would take days to do any of this, right? Um, but now you can do it in hours, and now it's even being optimized to minutes. And last but not the least is the change attitude, right? Um, that I think companies, um, groups, um, everybody across the ecosystem is re realizing the need to evolve and how it can get you there. So just that mindset shift that you're starting to see, and with AI becoming more and more prime time, that's also putting us on an inflection point to have more impact using data science and AI at scale. All right, this technology, I think, is just, I mean, it blows your mind, and I love to hear you know, your perspectives, and particularly, thank you for bringing up, you know, how, how much things have changed from your from your experience in grad school to now, because I think that's something that we kind of take for granted, is the, the speed at which we can compute these days. But, you know, beyond the technology and, like, this, you know, that, that sexy aspect of it, you know, I'd love to hear from you guys, like, how are you, how is this making its way into, like, reality? Like, share with us, if you can, some of the big wins. Like, put this into context for so we can understand how all of these different technologies are actually coming together to impact the way that you're doing your work. Perfect. Um, and, you know, I, I'm so glad you asked that question because there's always so much hype around it. And, you know, um, I remember a really good quote, um, someone's smart mentioned, which was that whenever there is some sort of a technological or any sort of evolution, everybody has more hype 
in the near term and underestimates the power in the long term. So just with that in mind, let's just go through, you said in R&D, right? What, like the headliner of where we're using it. And then let's dive into a couple of examples to make it real, you know, bring it home. So in terms of the headline, first, you know, you have to start off with what is driving the disease? What's causing the disease? And um, if you can understand that precisely well, right, really, really well, then you can be make better medicines. You know exactly what's uh, causing a protein to not work well in a cell or in a system, and therefore somebody's having a disease. That's number one. Then you want to make sure you have a really good molecule, small, biologic, antibodies, whatever it may be, so that it can actually go and fix the problem. Then you want to take that and put it in trials to understand, is it showing the same benefit when, you know, in human trials? And is the benefit good, the safety good, all that good stuff? And you want to recruit the trial well and have that solid evidence generation to then say, now this molecule is a medicine that helps patients. So that's the arc of what you're just big picture. Discover, develop, and deliver the best medicine for patients. And that's the core mission for J&J, for Janssen, pharmaceutical companies of J&J. So let's talk about AI. Step one, what's the root cause of the problem? You know, um, what we are trying to do now is using all this genomic, multi-omic data, we can much more precisely identify what's causing the disease and what are all the interactions. So I'll give you an example. Depression, for instance, major depressive disorder. You know, people think about it as one disease. It's actually not. We have found that there's multiple subtypes within depression. Why is that important? Based on the genetic architecture of a person or individual, why is that important? Once you understand that signature, you can make a medicine that doesn't just target everybody, but is specific to one type of depression. Precision medicine, that's the start of it. Second example, remember how I said you want to make these molecules that are really like fixing the problem? So what we're trying to do at this point together is my large language models are really exciting is you can start to now predict what the protein structure is that's working versus not just from the amino acids. So that's like the language of biology. You can use that to predict the structure, which then predicts the function. So you're understanding so much about it. And once you can predict the structure, guess what? You can figure out, are there little pockets on that protein where I can create a small molecule that can bind and stop the problem that's happening today? That's fundamentally what you're trying to do. But now we're finding more and more cryptic pockets that you couldn't find before using generative AI. And instead of um, doing things the old way, you're A, doing things you couldn't do before, making molecules for things that you couldn't um, target before. And second, you're doing it better and faster. So I remember, again, when I was in grad school, it would take me nine, 10 months to make a molecule. And then you're hoping that this thing works. Now you can generate it all in silico. So you're quickly going through the cycles, hours, days. So imagine you have a better starting point for a molecule and then you're going and targeting. And guess what? This is not just an idea. We're having great impact with that, being able to predict 20, 30 programs in our, in our, in our pipeline. Now let's go to clinical trials. You know, one of the biggest issues, um, you talked a little bit about rare diseases, prevalent diseases, just finding the right patient and finding them early on. So we're using AI on old data to solve new problems. So what do I mean by that? For instance, PAH, it's a rare disease. Patients get misdiagnosed for three, four years. We now have AI algorithms that can like, see the subtle changes in their ECG and pick up the person might have that disease three years in advance. Think about what that does to a patient. You know, with a lot of diseases, I'm sure there's many people listening that, you know, you think there's something wrong, you go to the doctor over and over and over again, mm -hmm. and they said, wow, this is so tough on a patient. Imagine yeah. you can use the data we already have today and then signal, you know what, this patient might have this disease. So then what it does is the patient is diagnosed early. You can have them be on trials or get the right treatment and you improve their outcomes. And then the last one, if I can just say, yeah, a big and which I really care about is trials. You know, um, only four or five percent of patients are in the trials that they should be. Sometimes they don't know about it, and sometimes they're not looking in the right place. So we're using real world data and machine learning algorithms to pinpoint where the eligible patient is. 
the heat map, right? And and while it's all de-identifies, we don't know the exact individuals, but we know which centers and hospitals. So we are going to where the patients are, putting the effort into open up new sites and recruiting them into our trials. So we have examples in several prevalent diseases in immunology where we have you know accelerated recruitment by 30, 40, 50 percent. It's really good for patients. And you get more diverse patients because you're going to areas that we haven't gone before. So just end end to end, you know, every single what that's why it's hard to say that with one example. Yeah. Every single aspect of how you discover and develop and deliver a medicine, it's stitched together. There are different ways we're applying AI to improve the probability of success and do things we couldn't do before. Right, Najat, I want to double click on the, you mentioned real world data in terms of like being helpful in identifying different clinical trial participants that you may not have found before. And I feel like, especially over the last couple of years, and thanks a lot in part to the development of, of the COVID-19 vaccine, um, I feel like real world data and real world evidence, even though it's been used in pharma for a, for a long time, has got like a, a new level of status. You yeah. know, is, is that the next big thing as far as big data and pharma R&D is concerned, real world evidence, real world data. And, you know, how do you see that changing, changing the way that the business is done? I mean, has it kind of changed in terms of status in your mind? And then what's changed and, and how do you see it impacting the business? Great question. So here's what I would say. The next big thing, and you're absolutely right, you know, observational health data has been used for decades, but the way it's being used, the quality of the data the approaches and the guidance, increasing guidance from regulators and acceptance from other parts of the ecosystem, that's all shifting, which is great. So here's what I would say. The next big thing is gonna be a combination of real data combined with AI machine learning, all of the right algorithms and approaches and, and, and digital health. That's what we call data science. To us, it's an equation of these three things. So real world data. Remember the example I mentioned about uh, being able to find these subsets of patients, like one disease is just it's yeah. a cluster of heterogeneous population. What do we use? We use real world data. What is real world data? All the OMIS data, EHR data, when you're going to the hospital, lab data, right? Um, why is that important? Because think about it. How are we going to understand what's causing a disease or why somebody is healthy? We don't have human data. And if that data is spotty, tell me, are you ever, no matter what, great algorithm you are, you can't solve the problem, right? So that's because, you know, when we do, historically, we've relied a lot on clinical evidence, like trial data, super important. It's clean, it's randomized, great. But this is an and, and that I would do want to emphasize because sometimes people tell me, oh, real world data is going to replace clinical. I'm like, no, you need both, right? You need both because the reality of it is we still have a huge room for improvement in the success rate of making medicines, right? It's like 10, 15 percent. You're telling me that we don't need more evidence. So that's where it's being starting to be used. And we've seen big progress. Then let's talk about the example I just mentioned in terms of finding the patients earlier. Rare disease, AL amyloidosis using ECG echo. All of that is real world data. We layer on really powerful machine learning algorithm, solve a question that matters. Find the patient early, give them the right treatment, improve their outcomes. Now, let's talk about um, the other aspect of real-world data, which external control arms, right? This comes up a lot. There's been some progress made. So, you know, external control arm, just for the audience here, is where, say you have a single arm study where you're giving the patient the active medicine. Now, somebody might say, hey, how does it do versus standard of care? Like, how much better is it? How much safer is it, right? So that's where you can actually use real-world data to construct the control arm, right? Now, Data quality has to be really good. And we have some good examples of where we work with the FDA and other regulators, full transparency on the data element the approach. I think that's going to pick up. It's not going to be a steep curve because you have to have very high quality data. But as the data gets better, the algorithms get better. This is good for patients. So you only put people on the active arm. And then the last example, remember I said, hey, we can go and understand where our patients are. We can now simulate and design a trial not just with experience from care wells and clinicians, which is so important, but also based on the experience of a patient in the real world. We can simulate what's the right inclusion exclusion criteria. Um, we can you know, simulate what's the right standard of care. There's so much you can start to do now. So 
big picture is changing how we think and how we work, how we design, how we execute. And it's an and, it's not an or. It's adding to our set of approaches as to how to do things better. I want to ask about the regulation side of this, because I think that that's one of the areas where it's just it still seems like I mean, regulators are it seems like very much interested in adopting this new data. And it seems like, you know, for maybe a new indication for a drug that's already gotten regulatory approval the old fashioned way um, and, and maybe even a little bit. I, I'm interested in what your experience has been with, um, you know, helping in terms of the initial approval for a new novel medicine. I'm not sure how that goes, but. Um, um, you know, I'm curious about what you're hearing from a regulatory side when it comes to accepting that body of evidence as data. I mean, it seems like there's a lot of evolution there, but, um, you know, there's also been a lot of, of caution because, you know, obviously, you know, people's lives could be impacted. So what what are you hearing? Like, what's the gossip that, you, that you've got, you know, for us about how, you know, the FDA and other regulators are looking at accepting real world data, real world evidence, you know, as far as, you know, an, a new indication for an existing drug that's already been been approved or the approval of a new drug or a new vaccine like we saw with COVID? Yeah, great question. So here, a couple of ways. So first of all, you know, there is data that you can, and evidence you can submit as supplemental or as primary, right? I think in terms of the supplemental space, that's really, we've seen a lot of uptakes. So what that means is that um, you have your clinical, your RCT data, and then you're trying to supplement it by saying, hey, Here's real data on the natural history of the disease, like just understanding what's the unmet need. For instance, we used real world data to get um, orphan drug designation approval for one of our rare disease indications. Or in oncology, where you know um, maybe the study is a single arm study, right? So you're trying to contextualize, you know, how patients are doing the unmet need, and so forth. That's quite important, right? When you're making those decisions. So I think there, there's been a lot of uptake and the FDA and other regulators, they've been, you know, there are things like pre-specification requirements, the RWB committee. So a lot of guidance and also expertise that they have developed, which is fantastic because that, that's how you go back and forth and iterate. I think in terms of a new indication using real world data as the primary, that's not there yet. And do I think it needs to be there yet? I mean, that's the question. Sometimes people have these aspirations and I'm like, well, Taking a step back, as you mentioned, my title, my, you know, I head up data science, but I also head up like the strategy portfolio. I'm just thinking what's best for the patient and how do we get the right medicine to the right patient? And for that, we need a lot of evidence. This is part of really important evidence, real data and clinical trial data. So for new indications, unless it's rare diseases, less, but much, much more on the supplemental side. And the last thing I want to say back to the, um, what's actually happening that's really exciting is some of the times when you look at real world data, you want to be able to corroborate that with clinical trial data. And what happens is like, think about it. If I get an endoscopy in a trial, I'm getting it every six weeks, 12 weeks, however it's specified. In the real world, you and I both know, I'm like, hey, I'm going to put it off for another two months. I don't want to go. I don't want to do this. I want to go on vacation. I have too much work. Whatever. Right? I'll do anything but that. <laughs> but, the, but those are like very real no pun intended, differences. So it's really great to see that there is a lot of uh, grants and other things that the FDA is doing where they're working with different companies to say, okay, let's do the methods, the rigor work, which is how do we uh, corroborate them better? Is there a way to do it? What methodology can we use? So that openness to develop new methods to actually even use real-world data more and more, we're definitely seeing that as well, which is really promising for what's going to happen over the next few years. Okay. I want to know what's hot to you right now. I mean, I feel like, you know, we had talked a little bit about the technology that's just changing the way that things are being done. I'm like, I love this whole conversation about real world evidence, real world data. I love yeah. hearing that that quality of that data is improving, you know, synthetic control arm. I'm hot on digital twin. I think that's a, like a super cool application for yeah. that. But, you know, like what what is like, you know, you, you've got to have a lot of different, you know, innovations that are pitched to you or that you, you see just by the nature of your role to help either model data more effectively or provide better analytics or maybe improve that computing power and take it down to, like you said, maybe seconds now instead of minutes. I don't know. But what are some of the things that you're hot on from a tech side that would then layer over the things that you're doing in terms of your process that can help make it faster, better, cheaper, smarter, you know, better for patients. I mean, tell me what you're excited about from an innovation standpoint. 
Yeah, I'm so I'm gonna pick a few because as you know, there's so many things that are going on. One I would say that I'm really excited about on the discovery, the drug discovery side is the fact that you can use a lot of this generative AI and large language models, similar to open AI, but the language of chemistry and biology versus the language of English or whatever language it might be. Why is that exciting? Because you're generating all of these new um, compounds, right? All of these new um, potential medicines, and then you're predicting um, how will they bind with that protein that's not quite working well, which is causing the disease. To me, that's really exciting because the, that technology is getting better and better and better. You're finding new pockets, like, you know, targets that were considered undruggable, proteins that you thought you couldn't modulate or change. Now we're finding new pockets that you can do something about. That unlocks so many different diseases that we couldn't do anything about before. So when I think about it as a, as a patient or somebody that is a patient, has family members that are patients, how many times do you pick up the phone and you realize that, that there's no treatment? It kills you. And that gets me excited because it's opening up. It's not better or faster. It's like novel, right? It's totally novel. And so you can open these doors for these diseases you couldn't open before. And to me, it's exciting because it's that same technology underlying foundational algorithms of, of generative AI that you're leveraging in, in, in the drug discovery space. So that's one. The other thing that I'm, I am really excited about is, you know, um, when we talk about um, finding patients earlier, right patient at the right time, all these AI algorithms finally starting to see more and more deployment, effective deployment, use of it in the healthcare system. Why okay. is that important? If you don't actually get all these great ideas at the point of care and change the practice of medicine, what's the point? It doesn't help the patient. So you're starting to see a lot of health systems and so forth upping their game, right? In terms of being able to deploy these algorithms to find a patient earlier, or to be able to find a patient that has a certain mutation, which causes a certain type of cancer, just using histopath images. We have examples of that. So not sequencing, it's looking at the histopath biopsy image, which like majority of patients are super excited about that. The third thing I'm super excited about, like if you think about a lot of people ask me about chat GPT and open AI, they're like, oh, there's all this stuff happening. I think that you're generating, you know, so good at like uh, generating new ideas or generating, synthesizing information. And I think about all of the protocols we write, right? All of the documents we're writing. And these are really smart people and it takes a long time. Could we use these approaches to have a better starting point for them? You want your best people working on the most interesting things. So, you know, um, being much smarter, faster, better in terms of how we generate various documents, generate new molecules. I think there's going to be a huge wave of that happening that we haven't been able to do before. So, listen, um, we, I, I think just the fact that we're even having this conversation, I couldn't imagine having five years ago. And I think right. we just have to have a, give ourselves, give all of ourselves a dose of gratitude that we get to be in a place in time where there's such big shifts in medicine happening, leveraging these new approaches, but also a dose of urgency, sense of urgency that we have this great gift. Let's make sure we use it in the right way, in a rigorous way, in a thoughtful way and so forth. All right, close this out for us with your with with kind of bringing us back from take us back from the bleeding edge and put us into today. But look ahead to the next five years because we started this conversation out talking about what had changed the most in the past five years leading up to now, as far as data, pharma, R and D. Now I'd like I'd like your forward look on the next five years. I mean, we're talking about these these technologies that are still very nascent. I mean, and they're exciting and the potential is there, but we also know how it goes in healthcare in terms of adopting and integrating those technologies and you know some move faster than others depending on where in the industry they are but you know the next five years for all, all practical purposes you know what does it look like in your mind you know when it comes to yeah. data's ability to impact r d in the next in the next five listen i think the way we discover medicines new medicines for patients that's evolving so much. And in five years, it's going to look very, very different and for the better, right? So like I was saying, there are these proteins that are squishy that you can't find a pocket. We're starting to figure out answers to that now. That's super exciting. So I think you're going to see a more a broader spectrum of diseases we can tackle. Super exciting. And, but I want to emphasize, 
the wet and the dry lab, the computation and the wet wet lab part, it ha has to be iterative, right? And you're going to see more and more of that. So it's going to be more and more equal versus it's mostly experimental and less uh, less computational. That's awesome. I'm super excited about that. You know what you're solving for in the right way, that everything you do downstream becomes much, much easier. The other thing I'm really excited about is today, you know, think about it. When you go to a doctor, you say, hey, I'm feeling better today. I'm feeling worse today and so forth. So we've seen the rise of all these digital solutions and whatnot, but they haven't really taken shape properly. The adoption isn't really there. Like, you know, I'll use an app and two weeks later, I'm tired of it or some, some other thing. But more and more in clinical trials, we're now starting to use digital endpoints that can be much more objective and precise. 24 hours is Jess actually feeling better. What makes her feel better? Is she adhering to the medicine the right way, right? Like all of these subtle things and changes that we can't measure today. Why is that important? You know, it's going to make our medicines better, Jess, but it's also going to make the patient experience and the patient engagement. You mentioned COVID. Patients and people in general became much greater consumers, much more engaged consumers than ever before. And I think we have an opportunity to do that because no matter how good your medicine is and how good your doctor is, if your patient isn't engaged, you can only do so much. And then the last thing I'll say is on that engagement point, I think we're going to become more inclusive. That's a, it's not a hope, that's a purpose for me personally, right? And what do I mean by inclusive? Um, if you think about these digital endpoints that we create, a lot of the data sets that exist today are not inclusive in of, of people of different demographics. So for instance, at Janssen, we started a fully decentralized trial um, for immunodurancy. These are germ diseases, fully decentralized. Okay. And we recruited so many patients, 45, within 45 minutes of going live, we recruited the first patient. Everything is done online, the consent, to, you don't have to go to the doctor. You take a picture with your phone, we all have it, and you say, you know, and just take the images and you do it on a regular basis. So the patient is engaged, the physician is engaged, and guess what? We're using, and it's all consented, those data sets to create the next generation of digital endpoints where you have endpoints that are relevant for not just people of certain color, but all different shades. And, you know, about 50%, 45% of those that have in now part of this trial are people of color. So you can actually break that change that we keep talking about. We need more you know, people of color. You can actually do that. It's all about using all these approaches and AI for good. So I'm really excited about you know, the promise and not just the potential, but actually doing it. I'm an impatient person. So I want to make sure in the next five years we're doing it. New medicine developed in a better way with evidence that's representative of the patients that actually have that disease and then ensuring that there's access to all. So I think we have a really good plan and path to do that. Uh, it's gonna be hard, nothing's easy. Change is hard. The first time you do anything is hard, but anything that's good in life is gonna be challenging. So um, game on and I think we're all up for it. We love it, game on indeed. That's so great. Well, John, it's a pleasure to chat with you. I love hearing like your perspective as somebody who's just, you know, a technologist, like your research strategy. I mean, it's just, it's exciting to hear, you know, such a, a long sweeping view of what's going on and how technology is really changing the way that, you know, pharma does business and how pharma develops, you know, um, it, it, its core, you know, pro products and services to help patients. I, I really appreciate you stopping by to share yeah. what's going on at Janssen. <laughs> All right, Najat, well, thank you again. I'm Jessica Namazan for more interviews with a who's who of health tech as they are changing the way that we do healthcare. Head on over to my YouTube channel. It's youtube.com slash WTF health. We'll talk to you guys again real soon. Thanks again, Najat. Bye. Thank you. Bye.